Okay, welcome back everybody. <clears throat> We're continuing on in chapter 12. Um, I'm going to be doing three lectures in this chapter. I wasn't sure uh, in the earlier lecture whether we'd have three or four, but I'm pretty sure we can get it into three. So this will be the second of three Zoom lectures for the drugs, microbes, host, the elements of chemotherapy chapter. So let's go to the PowerPoint. We last left off with various mechanisms that um, drugs used to kill bacteria. Um, and we are ready to talk about the last two, beginning with protein synthesis inhibitors. And again, you've got to go back and review um, one of the earlier chapters that described the DNA replication process and how proteins are synthesized. Um, and that is the transcription and translation processes in that order. Because many drugs impact the ability of the bacterial cell to make necessary proteins. And without enzymes, for example, which you know are proteins, um, it really stops any cell in its tracks if it, if it is unable to produce, for example, enzymes. But there are structural proteins as well that cells rely on. So as you can see from this um, kind of oval glow zone here, we're talking about how a number of drugs, a number of antibiotics target either the 50 or 30 or both 30 and 50 S subunits, which make up the ribosome where the protein is being assembled. So one thing that we should do is recall that ribosomes of eukaryotic cells are not quite the same structure or size as those found in the prokaryotic cells. And so when we talk about, as we will in just a moment, targeting 50S and 30S subunits, we're of course describing the effect on the prokaryotic bacterial ribosome itself. But we also need to be mindful of the fact that in eukaryotic cells, as we described back in one of the earlier chapters, when you look at the mitochondria and the chloroplasts of eukaryotes, they share similar uh, ancestry, similar structures to ancestral ancient forms of bacteria. Got to go back and kind of review that endosymbiotic theory. So when you look at the mitochondria in our cells, which you know is the organelle where ATP is synthesized, what you didn't probably know is that within those mitochondria are also ribosomes. And those ribosomes have very super similar structure and chemistry and, and, and functionality, just like the prokaryotic, present day prokaryotic ribosomes do. What does that mean? Why do we even bring that up? We bring that up because if we are talking about drugs that target ribosomes of prokaryotes, it could possibly be something that we wanna be conscious of because since our mitochondria also harbor prokaryote-like ribosomes, they could also, those drugs could also impact our mitochondria. Okay, we're gonna talk about a couple antibiotics here, including the aminoglycoside group, which as you see here, targets that lower, smaller 30S subunit of the ribosome. And it's interesting, as we described earlier in the chapter, that many of our present day antibiotics came from either bacteria or fungi, right? Well, here's in a, a genera, the Streptomyces genera that I talked about in the last lecture, um, that is a source for many of our present day aminoglycoside antibiotics. And these are extremely Im impactful, they're extremely um, accurate and, and, uh, and effective as a broad spectrum type of antibiotic. 
And while we can use them um, most usefully against gram-negative bacteria, especially the gram-negative bacilli, they also can target certain gram-positive bacteria. So thus they're very, very important um, in that broad spectrum um, you know, approach. And the two that I wanna mention here, as you see here in, in the white uh, font, is streptomycin and gentamicin. Now I'm not concerned that you know the fact that again, streptomycin is generally prescribed for things like tuberculosis or that gentamicin is effective against E. coli or salmonella. I don't think you need to get that specific in terms of drug affecting certain bacteria, but just be able to know that streptomycin and gentamicin are aminoglycosides. And if we denote these aminoglycosides as the uh, pink triangles here, we can see what they do. They, as we set up here, target the lower 30S subunit. So of course, here's the upper 50S, here's the lower 30S. In yellow here is the messenger RNA. I hope you recognize what these uh, cloverleaf yellow structures are. Um, we have the P site, we have the A site of the ribosome. So again, make sure you go back and review that from the previous chapter. So these aminoglycosides attach to the 30S subunit such that the messenger RNA cannot be translated. And if you can't translate the messenger RNA, are you gonna make polypeptide or protein? Answer is no. So that's how aminoglycosides prevent protein synthesis. They block the 30S subunit such that messenger RNA cannot be translated. The other major group here within the, um, or within the uh, drugs that target the 30S subunit, in addition to aminoglycosides, are the tetracyclines. And uh, you can see that tetracyclines share this common uh, four-ringed structure. Again, don't worry about the chemistry. I'm not gonna ask you to regurgitate that on a test or even to recognize that chemist chemical formula or, or structure on the test. But like the aminoglycosides, this is also a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic that does a real effective job at blocking the attachment site of the transfer RNA as it tries to fit into the A site of the ribosome. So again, take a look at the diagram. Here we see the uh, kind of delta shaped structure and how um, depicting the tetracycline drug, it comes in and it blocks the a site, remember there's a P site and an A site. Uh, and so this next transfer RNA doesn't bring in the next amino acid to be added to the growing polypeptide chain, cannot come in. If you cannot add amino acids, you stop protein synthesis in its tracks. Very effective. Um, tetracyclines are really great antibiotics, especially against certain sexually transmitted diseases, certain types of um, tick-borne um, diseases like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Lyme disease. You've all heard of Lyme disease, I think. Um, but we also use it to, to treat things like acne and food um, or waterborne um, cholera outbreaks. Even some protozoa can be targeted here. So it's kind of interesting. So it's affecting, again, the ribosome of the mitochondria when we talk about eukaryotic cells, right? Um, the, the upshot is it's fairly easy to manufacture. It's pretty cheap. It does have limited side effects. So from that standpoint, it's, it's, it sounds like a really great drug and it certainly does work. But as you see here, the downside is it can cause staining of teeth. I'll show you a photograph of that coming up and some GI tract issues as well. So um, and Chris, that could happen with almost any antibiotic, or many antibiotics, I should say, but um, this is one in particular that you have to be kind of conscious about. Some additional um, ways in which other antibiotics target the ribosome in addition to the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines is this guy called chloramphenicol. Here, however, we're targeting the larger upper 50S subunit. And so we'll depict the chloramphenicol antibiotic as this kind of green rectangle. And you can see, of course, that it is coming in and it is preventing the peptide bond that needs to form 
between the two amino acids being carried, in this case, by the two transfer RNA molecules. Because remember, as each um, amino acid is brought in, as the ribosome translocates one codon sequence during translation, um, we have to be able to add those amino acids one at a time, right, to create this growing polypeptide chain that's being held by this transfer RNA um, in the P site. Well, again, if you can't connect the amino acids, if you can't link them together, you won't make a polypeptide, you won't make a protein. So chloramphenicol, very effective in preventing those peptide bonds from forming. Oxazolidinones, um, what they do is they prevent the 50 and 30 S subunits from attaching to one another early in the translation process. So again, if we use this sort of uh, purple shaped uh, diamond to represent the oxazolidinone antibiotics, you can see how, again, they prevent these two subunits from locking in place, which needs to happen before you can begin to translate that messenger RNA and of course, start to bring in those amino acids, link them together to make the polypeptide. Erythromycin, another really important antibiotic, maybe you've heard of it. Um, notice what it does. It prevents ribosomal translocation. Now what translocation is, I mentioned it just a couple moments ago. Translocation is the movement of the ribosome down the messenger RNA, and that occurs at a, at a single codon sequence. So every time a new amino acid is brought in by the transfer RNA here in the A site, and then we link it together, right? And then this transfer RNA leaves, goes to pick up another amino acid. And then we have to have the uh, transfer RNA that was in the A site, it translocates into the P site so that it's now empty and the next transfer RNA can come, come in. So translocation is the movement of the ribosome. If you can't translocate the ribosome, you can't bring in amino acids, you can't make a protein. And again, we just talked about the tetracyclines a few moments ago. Blocking that A site um, is often what they do. So these are examples of how, again, various antibiotics target specific parts of the ribosome, all with the effect of preventing protein synthesis in the bacterium. Um, I'll uh, let you go ahead and play this video. I'm not gonna do it right now in the lecture, but make sure you do watch that. And again, as I've noted with the uh, instructions at the top, you gotta move your cursor down here to start that video. Several types of it. Okay. Our last um, impact, if you will, um, in terms of where in the cell uh, these drugs act, is the metabolism of the bacterium. Now, remember, we talked about metabolism in one of the earlier chapters. This includes both catabolism and anabolism. What's the difference? Do you remember? Catabolism is the breakdown of bigger, more complex molecules into smaller, simpler ones. Anabolism is the opposite. It's taking the small, simple molecules and linking them together to make a bigger, more complex molecule. Right. Um, protein synthesis is an example of an anabolic process, the construction of a polypeptide when we begin to link amino acids together. So you should think of metabolism not just from the catabolic point of view, it's also anabolic. It takes into account all the chemical reactions that occur within the cell. And there are thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of reactions going on. So if you can affect or interrupt critical key metabolic pathways or reactions, the cell's not gonna survive. That's what these drugs do. We're gonna talk about two, as you see here on the list, the sulfonamide drugs or sulfa drugs, you may have heard that term more frequently used, and a particular type of antibiotic called trimethoprim. So let's talk about the sulfa drugs or sulfonamides. Remember, any term that's read and underlined, you can click on it and hear the pronunciation of the term. And I would encourage you first to try to pronounce it and see if you pronounced it correctly because I get them wrong oftentimes and I've been saying these words for a couple of years now, but they're tongue twisters, some of them, but I think it's kind of fun to 
to see how they're pronounced. Um, so notice that all of these sulfonamide drugs or sulfa drugs have a very similar chemistry, just like we talked about in the last lecture, uh, for example, the penicillins um, or the cephalosporins. In the case of sulfonamide drugs, they share this common, we, we call it the nucleus of the molecule. In other words, all sulfa drugs have this, but where they differ, of course, are in the R groups. The R group really defines the, the name of that specific type of sulfa drug or sulfonamide. Um, and again, particular types of sulfonamide drugs are usually used to target specific types of infections. And you see some of those listed here. So how exactly do sulfonamides or sulfa drugs, and we're gonna, we're gonna include trimethoprim in this category, as you'll see in just a moment, how do they impact metabolic pathways? Well, what we're gonna talk about is a particular important metabolic pathway that needs to happen in all bacteria, actually even in all eukaryotic cells to some extent, but we're gonna focus on bacteria here. Um, all of these bacteria need to be able to synthesize DNA, right? DNA replication is a very important necessary process that has to happen. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's get back to our slide. So you've got to be able to make DNA, as we said a few moments ago. Um, in order for bacterial cells to make or synthesize particular types of nucleotides, specifically nitrogenous bases, actually. They need folic acid, it's called, folic acid. In order to make folic acid, a molecule known as PABA, and I'll give you the actual name of PABA in just a moment, but we're gonna call it PABA for now. PABA needs to be converted into a substance whose name is not important. And then that particular end product needs to be converted into folic acid. And so what sulfonamide drugs do, as you can see here in this glow box, they inhibit this particular enzyme that's necessary to convert PABA into this uh, dihydropoteric acid molecule. And then the, the dihydrofolic acid that is made from this by another enzyme needs to be converted into folic acid. And what trimethoprim does, as you can see here, is it inhibits this particular enzyme whose name we don't have to worry about. So what I want you to get, get to to kind of identify or think about is the fact that if we can interrupt either or even both of these important reactions by inhibiting these specific two enzymes, the cell cannot produce folic acid and it cannot in turn produce adenine and thiamine and cytosine and guanine. Those are purines and pyrimidines. Those are nitrogenous bases of DNA and some RNA, um, and uracil, we'll throw that in there as well. So all of the nitrogenous bases, basically, in order to be made by a bacterial cell, need to be able to go through this series of reactions. Um, if you can prevent the formation of folic acid, you'll prevent the formation of the nitrogenous bases. You can't then replicate the DNA. And as you can see here too, folic acid is also important for the synthesis of amino acids. So you're not gonna be able to make proteins either. 
So this is a really super critical set of, set of pathways or pathway, I should say, series of reactions that uh, we're going to try to interrupt with the help of sulfonamide drugs and trimethoprim. Okay, so this PABA molecule that I was talking about a few moments ago uh, stands for para-aminobenzoic acid. Again, you don't need to really know the name, but just recognize that PABA is the initial substrate that's going to be converted, okay, into this dihydropatoic acid, and then it in turn will be converted into dihydropatoic hydrofolic acid, and then in turn be converted into folic acid. That's the normal sequence that a cell, a bacterial cell, would, would undergo via these three reactions, leading to the formation again of nitrogenous bases and certain types of amino acids. What sulfonamide drugs do is they compete with that enzyme in the conversion of PABA into dihydropatoric acid. It inhibits the enzyme by acting as a competitive inhibitor. So here's that enzyme whose name is not important, but we need that enzyme to convert PABA. Ordinarily, PABA shown here as these um, kind of blue, uh, hexagonal molecules would normally fit into the active site of the enzyme. Again, go back into one of the chapters. We talked about that in uh, to a lot of uh, detail through a lot of uh, examples. Uh, and that would, of course, then convert that PABA into that particular uh, initial compound. Look at sulfonamide drugs like this guy. Um, this is the R group again. These look super similar, don't they? Other than some structural differences in this R group, they're identical. They're so similar, in fact, that as you can see in this middle box, the sulfa drug can also fit into the active site that PABA would ordinarily fit into. And if sulfa drugs are, are in higher concentration than PABA is, which it is indeed in this last box, we have many more sulfa molecules here. In fact, we've got, what, seven, I guess, versus the lower concentration of PABA, three of these. There's going to be an increased likelihood of more sulfa drugs fitting into the active site of that enzyme and, in essence, preventing PABA from being converted. Okay. So let me just flip back to this initial um, slide. So we cannot convert PABA. In the, in the presence of sulfa drugs, or if anything, we certainly reduce its conversion. We produce much less, ultimately, nitrogenous bases and amino acids. That could have significant impacts on the cell, as we've said. Well, now let's throw into the fray trimethoprim, which will do the same thing by competing with the normal dihydrofolic acid for the active site of the enzyme, in the same way that sulfa drugs competed with PABA, that is going to have a significant impact in reducing the conversion of the dihydrofolic acid into folic acid, okay? So we can use them individually, or what often happens, as you see at the bottom of this slide, we can combine the two drugs. We can combine sulfa drugs and trimethoprim together with the hopes of inducing what's called a synergistic effect on the bacterium. In other words, the combined action of the two antibiotics will be more effective than if we use just one alone. So in concert, these two um, drugs do a super great job at limiting and, and, maybe, and actually even shutting down DNA replication and to some extent protein synthesis, because you're, again, you're not making the nitrogenous bases that you need for replication. You're not making amino acids that you need for protein synthesis. Okay, so we've spent quite a bit of time talking about antibacterial antibiotics. 
we're going to spend some time next talking about antifungal, antiprotozoan, and antiviral drugs. Drugs come in all sorts of ca categories and classifications. We're not going to really get into that, but if you're into uh, uh, pharmacy or become a pharmacist, you'd be learning all about the different drug families. You'd be learning about all the names, both the um, generic names and the trade names. It gets to be quite mind boggling. There's so many different terms and there's new drugs being uh, invented. It seems all the time, just watch TV. There's always some advertisement for new drugs and they come up with a slick sounding name sometimes. So with respect to fungal infections, and now remember we're transitioning from prokaryotic cell to eukaryotic cell control. Fungal infections are fungi, they're eukaryotic. Protozoans are eukaryotic, okay? So we have to always be careful when we use any drug against a eukaryotic pathogen, like a fungus or a protozoan, that we don't or we limit the toxicity impact on healthy tissue, healthy cells. We're only going to talk about really one antifungal drug, and this, that's this category of the macrolide polyene antibiotics of which we have two, amphotericin B and nystatin. Interesting, again, as I note here, nystatin named after New York State where we discovered this or where it was sort of developed. So amphotericin B, um, which is, um, as you see in this inset, insert box rather, is only used in this particular example for intravenous transfusions. Um, although it, it can be used in other ways as well. It can be a systemic uh, uh, therapy, or you can even have a topical ointment that has amphotericin B or, or an nystatin in it too. But this one happens to be one that has to be put into an IV. Um, it has a very complex ring structure, doesn't it here? So, Amphotericin B and most of these polyene, uh, macrolide polyene antibiotics, including nystatin, um, what they really do is they get in and they interrupt the, the cell membrane of the fungus, um, sort of like a detergent uh, emulsifies the, uh, the lipids that we saw earlier in one of the uh, antibiotics that we target bacterial cell membranes with. Um, in terms of antiparasitic chemotherapies, and I'm talking here uh, about protozoans and also helminth worms. Okay, again, we, we surveyed these in lab, I think the second week of, of the semester, and we talked a little bit about this in one of the earlier chapters. Um, there are a number of antiparasitic drugs out there. I can speak to the first one because I've taken it on numerous occasions when I travel to the tropics. And that's a drug called chloroquine. Um, quinine is a similar um, chemical to chloroquine. Um, but typically, these are given prophylactically. You remember what that word means, I hope. Um, and typically, this would be taken when you are um, traveling to parts of the, of the world, typically um, warmer tropical areas, where there is the risk of you getting exposed to a particular pathogenic protozoan. Now, as it says, of course, in the uh, bracket there, um, chloroquine is given prophylactically when there's a concern about you getting bitten um, by a mosquito that carries the uh, plasmodium protozoan that could give you malaria. Um, there are many other types of drugs that are targeting other types of pathogens. If you remember, we talked about African sleeping sickness a while back, uh, dengue fever. Um, oh gosh, there's just a whole slug of tropical diseases that we do have medications for. Um, many of, of them though would be taken after you've been diagnosed with having been infected you know, with the, with the pathogen, but 
But some, like this uh, chloroquine, can be taken prophylactically. There are some downsides to it. It can cause st stomach upset in some people, um, a little bit of headache. Um, and normally, when I used to take it, I would take a pill a couple of days before I would leave. And then while down um, there, I would take a pill, I think, every three days. And then when I came back, uh, it was a similar regimen. I think it was like a pill or, or so every every three or so days for two weeks following my return to the States. Uh, I never did get malaria, thank goodness, but um, it's not something to play around with. So, so it, it, word to the wise, if you ever travel to the tropics, uh, any, any parts of the world really, um, where you could potentially get infected, um, you know, make sure you're, you're being, paying close attention to, to any uh, health concerns that uh, that might exist. The, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on their website, they have all that information. You can just type in the country you're visiting and they'll give you a list of possible pathogens and, and drugs that you might wanna consider taking prophylactically or before you go. Um, this second one here, Flagle is the, um, is the more generic name or industry name for this drug, is targeting a number of protozoa that we talked about again uh, in both lab and lecture, Entamoeba histolytica that causes nasty, nasty dysentery, Giardia lamblia, another single cell pro protus that can cause terrible, terrible diarrhea uh, and dehydration and, and really screws up your electrolyte balance. Um, very effective. And in terms of anti-helminth drugs, these again are targeting tapeworms, roundworms, those sorts of, uh, of uh, eukaryotic organisms that can cause problems. Uh, flukes also would, in, would be included in this group. There are a number of drugs. I, again, I'm not gonna ask you to know those. I am not gonna try to pronounce them. Um, I, I was unable to find uh, easy pronunciation guide, so that's why you can't click on it like you can this guy to hear the pronunciation. But I think it's kind of interesting in terms of looking at what they do. So, you know, this pair of anti-helminth drugs are inhibiting the action of microtubules. Now, what are those? Well, remember from basic bio, microtubules are involved in the movement of chromosomes during mitosis, right? Think back. Yep. Um, Paralyzing muscles of certain types of roundworms. If the, if the muscles can't work on the roundworm, it can't move around. It's not going to do very well. This one destroys the scolex of the tapeworm. Here's the scolex. It's got some suckers here on the side and this, this beastly looking set of barbs that it uses to embed itself in, into your lining of your small intestine. Yeah, this dissolves that and the tapeworm is basically shed uh, out the feces. Can't hang on to the wall of the small intestine. Okay, and finally, let's talk about some antiviral drugs. Now, one thing that we have to remember is that viruses are acellular, right? They are not cells. You cannot kill a virus because it's not alive. And so toxicity is, um, not really um, so much an issue because um, we don't naturally harbor, for the most part, viruses in our bodies. Um, because in order to, to cause issues to you and I, we know that the virus needs to get into the cell and uh, deposit its RNA or its DNA. Uh, and then, of course, the host cell responds by constructing new viral capsids and new viral nucleic acid, and then that gets packaged in the cell, and eventually the cell will, will bud that virus off, um, or it might lice, the cell might pop, and uh, thousands and thousands of viral particles will be released into the bloodstream or, or wherever. So since viruses need to get into host cells, how do we target these, these things without hurting our cells? Right, think about that. If we're, we're gonna try to knock out a virus while it's in our cells, 
it could really cause some problems in terms of affecting the, the health or viability of our cells. So we have to think about the life cycle, if you will, of these acellular pathogens. One way to control viruses, and we're gonna talk about this, is to prevent them from getting into the host cell or prevent them from leaving. Either way, you're stopping the viral infection in its tracks. If it can't get into the host cell, if it can't get out, it's not gonna cause problems. So let's talk about that. Let's give an example of a, a, a pair of drugs, antiviral drugs, that do just that, that in this case are preventing the virus from leaving the cell. Relenza and Tamiflu. Maybe you've heard of Tamiflu. Um, oftentimes, these drugs need to be given really, really early in the, in the, during the time you have flu. These, these are targeting influenza um, infections. So, so influenza-based viruses typically are um, envelope viruses. So what these um, antiviral drugs basically do is they prevent a particular enzyme from functioning. It's called neuraaminidase A, or just neuraaminidase. I guess we won't specify which one it is, but there are different kinds of neuraaminidase uh, blockers, if you will, depending upon whether we're talking about influenza A or B. We're not gonna get into that detail right now. But let's just remember, that this particular enzyme, which is going to be denoted, I'm sorry, the, the drug is going to be denoted by this little kind of Y-shaped structure. The enzyme is going to be shown here. Uh, let's see, do they show the enzyme shape? I guess they don't. Um, in essence, ordinarily, in when a when a influenza virus wants to leave a host cell, it's got to be you know, packaged in its protein coat, as we've talked about before. And then it has to, the, uh, the nucleocapsid needs to move toward the cell membrane, right? And that's where it's going to get its envelope, as it ordinarily then would bud from the cell, right? Again, go back into the virus chapter and review that if you need to do that. What Tamiflu and Relenza do is they, they position themselves here on the cell membrane of your cells. And in essence, it prevents the budding and release of the virus from the cell. It doesn't allow for the um, envelope to be constructed and then placed on the surface of the nucleocapsid. Okay, so again, basically prevents the budding and release of the virus from the cell. If you can't bud and release viruses, can you have an infection? The answer is no. Now, the cell has already been infected, right, by the virus, so you can't do really much for the cell. It's probably gonna die at some point in time, but you're at least nipping this infection in the bud by not allowing more virus escapees, if you will, to go on to infect other cells. So that's the concept behind these particular antiviral drugs. There's others as well as you see here. Don't worry about them. You're not going to need to know those, but some prevent the drug from getting in and some prevent the drug from getting out. This impacts um, not the drug, the virus from getting in or getting out. Now we've talked a little bit about HIV, which you know is the virus that causes AIDS. HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus. And the HIV or AIDS virus is a reverse transcriptase using virus. It's called a retrovirus. And we spent some time talking about how reverse transcriptase works. I've given you a summary, a review of that right here in this slide. So make sure you understand what reverse transcriptase does. This is brought on board the cell by the virus, by the HIV, once it gets in. And it's absolutely critical 
for the life cycle of this particular virus. You got to have proper functioning reverse transcriptase. Absolutely critical. Well, what some chemotherapeutic drugs do is target the reverse transcriptase enzyme of the retrovirus. Okay. And there's a number of ways that this happens. And I'm going to show you a slide of that in just a moment. But one particular drug that gained a lot of press back early in the AIDS um, infection here in the United States in the 80s and 90s is, is this drug called AZT. This was one of the first anti-AIDS uh, AIDS virus drugs. Since that time, we've developed a whole cocktail of, of uh, anti-HIV drugs that, have, that has turned HIV into what once was a, a, a death sentence to an infection that can be pretty much controlled um, for the duration of an individual's life. So we've made just massive inroads which is not to say that there are not still problem areas in the world. There are, there are people dying from AIDS as we speak. Um, so the battle is not over, um, but if you get AIDS in the United States today, we can turn that into a pretty treatable chronic um, infection basically. But if you're a native of you know, Sub-Saharan Africa and you get AIDS, no guarantee that you're, you, you might not you know, survive. Um, that infection it can sometimes take years, but we don't have those therapies sometimes available, unfortunately. So how do um, these drugs work? Well, I circled here a group of reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I'm not concerned that you know the difference between the nucleoside analog type or the non-nucleoside inhibitor type. It's not critical to me that you know the, the difference, but let's just see what these two inhibitors kind of do. How do they impact this important enzyme? Okay, so we are, we're depicting the nucleoside analog inhibitors with this pink shape and the non-nucleoside reverse inhibitors by this kind of purple shape structure. In either case, the reverse transcriptase enzyme cannot function the way it should. It cannot make single-stranded DNA from the messenger RNA that was introduced by the virus. If you cannot reverse transcription, if you cannot make single-stranded DNA, and then double-stranded DNA and have that become incorporated into the nucleus of the host cell, then you're not going to be synthesizing more nucleocapsid and more messenger RNA that needs to be fit into that HIV virus um, particle. So it basically inhibits the action of the enzyme once the HIV is into the, in, inside the cell. This doesn't impact its ability to get in or to get out. It impacts its ability to take messenger RNA and make single-stranded DNA initially and then double-stranded DNA. Here's another approach that you can take with respect to treatment of HIV. It's using another group of um, inhibitors. These are called protease inhibitors. So let me go to the next slide. This is the um, third section of that figure in your book. They're on page 386. What these protease inhibitors do is, as it indicates here, they prevent the assembly of the necessary viral proteins during HIV assembly in the cytoplasm of the cell. So remember, in the case of HIV or any virus really, 
you've got to take that nucleic acid and you've got to surround it with protein capsid, right? And form what's called a nucleocapsid. What these protease inhibitors do is they attach themselves to an enzyme called protease. And notice it says ASC, so I know it's an enzyme. This is an HIV enzyme. It's necessary to cut the proteins so they can be properly then assembled to make the HIV particle. If the protease inhibitor prevents the protease drug from working, you will not snip and cut the protein capsids in the proper way, and you therefore cannot construct the HIV particle. So you will not prevent this virus from budding from the cell. Okay, it buds. The, the, the good thing for us is that this particular virus cannot infect other host cells because remember, in order to infect, infect other host cells, it has to has, have these glycoproteins, these spikes that fit into the receptor sites of the host cell membrane, remember that? Like has occurred here. Only this virus isn't containing the proper shaped protein coat because we prevented that from happening because we screwed up the action of the enzyme that it, would, that it would use to make the proper shaped proteins that makes up the wall of the particle. Um, now note here, this is an important thing to keep in mind. It is important to note that most antivirals are unable to eliminate extracellular viruses or those in, in the latent state. By the latent state, we mean inside the cell kind of hiding, resting, only to rear their ugly head down the road, you know, when, when they're stress induced or some environmental change that occurs within the body. So once the virus is out here in the bloodstream, for example, or the cerebral spinal fluid or anywhere outside the cell, it's super hard to get rid of. What we do, as you hopefully by now have figured out, is we somehow impact what goes on within the cell by screwing up the virus's ability to replicate, to uh, undergo a particular important series of reactions, um, to make proteins like the protease inhibitors do. Um, so we're, we're targeting processes within the host cell. And, and some of these antiviral drugs are extremely good at doing that. Um, interferons, I'm going to just say a couple words about interferons. We talked about interferons back in a &P one In the lymphatic system, we make brief mention of these naturally produced glycoproteins that have amazing antiviral and anti-cancer properties. Just super critical, important compounds made by our fibroblasts, which you might remember are the most abundant types of, of uh, connective tissue cells. Leukocytes, of course, are what? Leukocytes. Those are white cells, right? Different white cells produce interferons. Um, when you get an, a viral infection or when you have cancer, these cells are cranking out interferons with the hopes of knocking out that virus or killing those cancer cells. And so there's been a lot of work done in the last 30, 40 years with respect to altering um, uh, the chemical signature of some, some of these naturally occurring interferons and as it says here, via recombinant DNA technology, so we can affect the, um, the, the shape of some of these molecules. Um, so they're, they're really important natural viral fighting chemicals, uh, cancer fighting chemicals that we make ourselves. Okay, I think I am going to actually stop here. I'm gonna change my mind. I might do four lectures instead of three for chapter 12. So we'll pick up here with interactions uh, between microbes and drugs and talk about drug resistance in the next lecture.